difficulty with the subject of self-determination because none of us knows what's on the other side of death. You know, we see darkness. The baby boom generation consist of up to 28% of, uh, of the United States, which could equate to 78 million uh, U.S. Americans. They said that one in five would be elderly by the year 2030. Um, I think that topic will come up very often, and they may see it as maybe they could, you know, leave uh, their legacy and also maybe a little bit of wealth to their family if they choose uh, the Death with Dignity Act. Euthanasia broadly speaking, meaning some sort of like good death, could be brought about by anyone, not necessarily a physician. And physician-assisted suicide means that there are those in the medical industry who are trained and have the knowledge um, to be able to end someone's life in a presumably painless way that's quick and efficient. Dr. Kravorkin was a physician in Michigan who, uh, for all intents and purposes, had stopped practicing medicine, but he actually at first sought out patients who would be good candidates uh, for him to help end their life in a painless way. You know, I, when I started doing uh, nursing in 1994, I was working with ALS patients, and that's uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. It was a small specialty unit in a nursing facility up in Bucks County. And every patient with ALS at that time believed in Dr. Kevorkian and physician-assisted suicide. They felt as though, you know, being of sound mind with their body deteriorating and dying around them, they felt very comfortable making that decision. And in 1994, the news was always about Dr. Kevorkian, and they felt strongly about it. The th book I've written, like any normal day, uh, addresses that uh, uh, in a profound way. Uh, it's about an ordinary American family who suddenly find themselves steeped in an extraordinary circumstance. Buddy Miley, who was a high school quarterback, in his senior year, and in his third game of the season, he ran a play and uh, was tackled and uh, uh, broke his neck. At that point, he lived as a quadriplegic for the next 23 and a half years in intense pain and loneliness. In 1997, he uh, talked his uh, youngest brother, uh, Jimmy, into taking him to Michigan uh, to seek the services of Dr. Jack Kevorkian. You know, I think that the interesting thing is that, you know, when s these sorts of accidents occur, if you're born in um, uh, a quadriplegic state or if you're born with an infirmity that, uh, that, 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 that that's all you know, I think your reaction to it and your ability to cope with it is far different than if it happens when you're 17 and you've had a taste of of, of, of what life has to offer. What saddens me uh, about this is that, and it goes to uh, our public policy on, on, on uh, assisted suicide, is that Buddy had to fly in secrecy to, uh, to Michigan 
and die in a kind of a drab motel room surrounded by strangers. So Buddy died alone. Our last glimpse at, at the world should be uh, the face of someone we love. Uh, and our public policy precludes that. I was uh, sort of keenly aware of the issue from a pol public policy perspective, but it actually became um, sort of personal to me when a couple close members of my family uh, actually died of cancer. Um, and during this process, uh, I saw one of the things that the chemotherapy and the disease itself does is it causes a wasting away of people and, and great pain. You can't help when confronted with that uh, to start uh, contemplating what decisions you would make and what decisions you would want to make or at least have the power to make if you were in that position and so I started thinking about that and I was like you know I'd want to decide what 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 the end of my life looked like if I had to face that and um, current law does not allow you to do that so I want to that's what I wanted to change yeah there is religious opposition which I have little tolerance for I'm a Christian. I, I believe in um, really our acknowledgement of, of the authority of God over our lives. And I don't think that it's, uh, we never see example as far as scripture is concerned where people uh, take their own lives, um, at least not God-fearing or God-obedient people. I mean, we all have our religious beliefs. Uh, the thing is that, and the thing that I think people have to understand who come from a religious perspective is, I mean, I respect their religious perspective and their right to make decisions in accordance with that. But not everyone believes in your religion. <laughs> and no, no one else should have to live according to your religion if they don't share it. I'd have to vote down anything that I don't agree with morally. Even if you take the religious aspect aside, let's put the Bible aside and the religion aside. As a moral character, my person, my, you know, as a, as, a, as a person, I don't agree with it. People who, for, for on, a, on again, a wide range of issues, I don't fully understand, but they feel, the, they feel compelled to tell other people how to live their lives. And so we have to fight that. I, I don't think that it's a good practice for America. I think that it can lead to a slippery slope. I think that it can be abused. And I also value life. And it's very hard for me, if I were to make a judgment call on this law, it'd be very hard for me to decide what life has value and what life doesn't. Most people who get this do not take it right away. In fact, some never take it at all. Uh, just having it as, a, as an option gives them enough peace of mind and enough control that they can go on. No one's looking to cut their life shorter than it needs to be. Uh, in fact, when it is used, it's typically used in the last couple of days. It's not used, you know, six months out when the person's still doing okay and it's all some quality of life. It's used in the last few days when things are just really awful. Now when it comes to death with dignity, we can say, look, people with a certain quality of life or a certain loss of mental capacity who don't want to live by their own admission and, and would cause pain to family members who have to take care of them, you know, it's, it's easier and it's merciful to allow them to die. Well then does that become legislation that now allows people to, to overrule a patient who maybe we deem has no mental capacity and say, well, what they're saying isn't true, they have dementia, they have Alzheimer's, we're gonna kill them because we don't wanna pay healthcare costs for them. I think it can lead to that. When I debate this issue, I rarely come across a rational argument. It's always like, well, my God doesn't like this and you know, these other issues that really aren't real. I think we need to be very careful that we, we think about these things from a moral perspective and from a, uh, from a God-fearing perspective because ultimately that's how the decision needs to be made. Uh, you know, ironically, um, a lot of the people who oppose this law, if it were them, would want this choice, okay? Uh, and we see that as, as you know, in, in, in places where you can make this choice. People are like, you know, if I'd known people are facing what I'm facing now, I never would have tried to interfere with what they wanted to do. And I have family members, even as we speak, that are in uh, nursing homes and hospitals that are on their way towards death and not comfortable death. And it would be very easy for me to look at uh, family members who are caring for these particular loved ones 
and to look at them themselves and say, they're not the ma family members that I used to know. They're not in the condition that I'd want to see them in. It's better to see them go. E even as a Christian, knowing that they have something better, a hope of eternal life, it, it's easy for me emotionally to say, it's better for them to go. But I don't think that that's what's best for me or for society. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who really is one of the pioneers of um, a sort of death with dignity writ large uh, here in the United States, she was very concerned that the United States and Western Europe had become a culture where as family members age and need increasing help, that we put them in institutions that are cold, sterile, and uh, that families no longer take care of our most vulnerable members. And I think that her point is almost inarguable. It's not a social norm at this point in history for parents and grandparents and many families, of course there are always exceptions, to return to the home. I don't even think it's the way when we discuss the financial crisis. I don't think that people talk about the finance of what it means to bring someone back. Um, we talk about what it means to raise children and if both parents will work or not work or how that will be negotiated. The discussion isn't about end of life issues. And so not being a cultural norm nursing facilities and hospitals become places where um, people spend in many situations the last days, weeks, months of their lives. There are exceptions and that's the hospice movement that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross um, you know, vocally supported. There's been a lot of poor education uh, as far as hospice care. There are still a lot of patients uh, that don't know that hospice is available to them and sometimes we find that doctors aren't uh, promoting it as much as maybe they should and we're getting patients um, you know very late um, and end-of-life care should be some time to give them quality of life uh, and not the you know the brink of death care and I don't think that God's gonna heal every single person with a terminal illness and I, I think that God does allow people to die at certain times for a reason but I also think that perhaps we can assess a situation and say, this is God being me. This is God doing things for a specific reason. And we can't really be sure of that. People might have illnesses and might be kept alive, not for their purposes, not because God wants to do something with their life. Because we could easily say, what could a person do sitting in a hospital bed with no functionality and, and hardly any capacity to, to communicate? or Well, maybe it's not for them, but it's for the people around them. Maybe it's for the nurses, the doctors, maybe it's for their loved ones. Maybe God's teaching people around them a lesson and God's showing something through their life for a particular purpose. So it's hard for us to play God and it's hard for us to put God in a box and say, this is cruel, this is wrong, you know, God wouldn't want this. We can't, we can't make assumptions about the way God works because we're not God and we don't have that intelligent, infinite intelligence. There are things that we encourage family to do, maybe, uh, take some time off with a family medical leave. Uh, it's very rewarding work. Uh, it's one that, you know, maybe they could give back to a parent or a family member uh, by taking care of them and maybe help them be more comfortable at home. Uh, we would want, um, you know, uh, you know the, all of the United States to, you know, embrace the idea of, of taking care of somebody at home, allowing them to die peacefully. I, I don't know what I would do in that situation, but I do know that I would want to be the one making that decision. I would be the one, uh, I would want to be the one to decide when I, uh, I died. Uh, you know, do you want to die with your family and friends around you, or do you want to die at four in the morning when no one's there? Um, these are decisions I'd want to make. Uh, how much, it depends what you know, you're dying of, obviously, but how much pain can I endure? I mean, I, none of us knows that until we do it. So these are all things that I would want to, um, you know, have control over myself rather than have, again, some irrational policy deciding for me. I think that we as a society need to appreciate life for what it is and see the, the, the positive aspect of life, no matter how functional, how able it is, or 
how sad it might be even at the end. And although we may feel like we're doing a service to people who have lost a quality of life that we would deem you know, satisfactory or that we would deem uh, you know, appropriate, uh, I, I think that we really tread on moral ground and when we try to play God and decide when life should end and when life no longer has meaning. It's our right uh, to have self-determination over our bodies and over, you know, how we die and how we live. Uh, and I hope the book would, uh, you know, at least start a conversation, a sober conversation about the subject. The more states do it, the more people see that this doesn't lead to like mass suicides of people who are upset because their boyfriend broke up with them uh, and all the other crazy stuff we hear. Um, and, and, you know, they'll, th this, this will happen. Uh, I'm just hoping, you know, every day that it doesn't happen is an injustice because every day that it doesn't happen, someone is suffering who doesn't have to suffer. Hopefully we'll, none of us will ever face these decisions, but if we do, that we'll have the choice to make the decisions that are right for us.